Hello and welcome to this Telesummit on Feminism as a Sustainability Tool. I'm Jenny LaMorgan. I'm a social entrepreneur and owner of GreenWomanStore.com, where education is a priority because education empowers us and because education is where change begins. We enjoy creating educational tools like this Telesummit on topics important to us as women. Feminism and sustainability are two collective quests that touch every aspect of our lives. Feminism has always brought hope, a lot of hard work, and truth to whatever issue it touches. We'll talk about the sustainability of feminism and the important role that feminism plays in real, lasting, and global sustainability. Our goal is to bring you hope and tools for the future and an expanded global reality. I'm excited to be here with our co-host, Carolyn Gage, to bring you experts on the topic of feminism with case studies from the U.S. and around the world. Carolyn is a lesbian feminist playwright, performer, director, and activist. She is the author of 12 books and more than 65 plays, musicals, and one-woman shows. She specializes in traditional roles for women and reclaims famous women's stories that have been distorted or erased from our history entirely. In 2014, Carolyn was one of six featured playwrights at the 53rd Annual World Theatre Day in Rome, sponsored by UNESCO. And now I'd like to introduce our guest. She is a leader with over 25 years' experience in diplomacy and international relations. She is working to build a more representative, accountable, and effective international political system. Shazia Rafi was born in Lahore, Pakistan. She is bilingual in English and Urdu and proficient in French, Hindi, and Punjabi. She has a master's degree in international political economy from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Her regional specialization is in the Islamic countries in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. From 1996 to 2013, Shazia Rafi served as Secretary General of Parliamentarians for Global Action, a nonprofit, nonpartisan group of elected officials from over 130 nations. Prior to joining Parliamentarians for Global Action, Ms. Rafi served for five years as the United Nations Representative for the All Pakistan Women's Association. As a consultant, Shazia served and helps lead nonprofit organizations working on governance, peace, and gender equality to improve their outcomes and expand their reach. As a journalist, she covers South Asian politics and women's empowerment for publications, including Ms. Magazine and the Women's Media Center. As a speaker at leadership conferences and an advisor to university programs, she trains the next generation of political leaders. I'm very much looking forward to the international breadth of this discussion. Let's get started. Welcome to our co-host, Carolyn Gage. Thank you, Jenny. And um, I can't tell you what a privilege it is to be speaking with Shazia Rafi. Um, just um, we had a conversation earlier, and I've been reading about her work and. It just seems like every major area of reform necessary on this planet is something that she has been involved with, and I'm just really honored. So I thought maybe we would start with your work as the Secretary General of Parliamentarians for Global Action. Um, what would you like to tell us about this group and your parliamentary advocacy? Well, first of all, um, this organization was started in Washington, D.C. in 1978 uh, by members of Congress um, and members, uh, their colleagues from Canada, the U.K., France, and Japan to help get the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty off the ground to get it out of the drawer of peace groups onto the table of governments. Um, and so it is a very activist uh, group, but it is one which instead of being sort of, you know, out in the street placard waving um, activism is much more focused on how do you 
bring power and idealism together, which is what attracted me to the organization. Um, I was the first and only, unfortunately, still the only woman to have led a global parliamentary group as Secretary General. I almost came close as the runner-up finalist um, to the post of Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union last year, um, but uh, it was not easy um, as it was a large organization with regional block voting. Um, what I want to say, I think, about the work that I did at PGA is that we worked to build lasting change on an institutional level um, within the international system. And in that, um, we used the international treaty mechanisms, how to get agreement among countries that will become legal norms, but that will also become policy norms. So if you know the UN system, it has about 260 treaties, conventions, and agreements. Um, of those, some are legally binding treaties, which means that those who join the treaty, it is the domestic law uh, enforcement for them as well. And so the two treaties that I had the privilege to work on and to see through agreement to ratification to implementation are the International Criminal Court, uh, which was agreed in Rome in 1998, ratified by the required number of countries by 2002, and now is well into legal implementation at the national level. Um, the second is the Arms Trade Treaty, which was the last treaty agreed during my tenure, which uh, was very satisfying to me because I came from South Asia, a region which is overrun by illegal weapons. And I'm also a dual national of the U.S., and I know I think we've got maybe as many weapons as we have uh, citizens in this country, or maybe not. Uh, yes, it's, uh, so, it's, it's somewhat ridiculous. So it's, yes. So, I mean, you know, taking the first step at the international level to have an agreement by countries that there is no unregulated right to bear arms. Um, that we have to come up with a system which will allow only regulated declared weapons um, to be uh, bought for specific purposes, this was a major step. Um, on the development side, the, um, the agenda is harder, and unfortunately the issue of gender falls more on the development side in these international meetings, which means that there is no legally binding agreement on development. The closest we got was the work that the international system did on the Millennium Development Goals, um, which we were also involved with because the person leading that negotiation um, was a woman from the Netherlands. She'd been um, their development minister, and before that she'd been on the board of PGA. Her name was Evelyn Hafkins. And um, there, I think we got close to this notion that if countries can agree by consensus to certain goals and targets and agree that they will work together and at the national level to achieve them, that is as close as we will get to something that is morally binding or policy binding. And that has been the way that women and development issues have been dealt with in the system. So I think part of the frustration is that while there is a convention uh, on elimination of discrimination against women, the CEDAW convention, making that effective and binding at the national level has been a major struggle. I mean, even in this country, we do not oh, yeah. have the ERA. Yeah, the exactly. The ERA is not yet passed. So. This is where um, the work is incremental. The work is uh, bringing up the issue of women as a, and women added on to everything um, as a, what about the women, where are the women at every discussion is, you know, where I think um, I felt my role uh, was as well that while I was representing an organization where the percentage of women when I started uh, was 11% and when I ended was close to 30% in the membership, it still was not, um, you know, 
at a 50-50 level. Um, I was able to work with a very progressive board, um, and we were able to change the actual board constitution so that our elections were 40-60 either gender, which was a real breakthrough, and no other international organization has that. That um, is just that is huge. That's really uh, it was impressive. huge, and it was and it was very interesting as to how it happened. It was of course Sweden which put that up, but other countries supported it. And what was also interesting was that you know there was some resistance to it, but I think people felt that if they were going to go out into the international arena and say, we are the organization that has taken the step to appoint a woman in this position. We are the organization that has taken a step to change a dynamic. Um, now we have the moral authority to ask others to do so. But, ah, it's, yes. been ve- but yes. it's been very hard to get um, other institutions to do so because it is a zero-sum game. Um, it means that men actually have to vacate seats, and men and men within the organization, you know, really realized that and took that decision despite that. Yes. It wasn't as if they were expanding the board and then giving women more seats. They were actually agreeing that they would be bound by the, they still the same number of board members, but 40, 60 either gender. Um, you know, I I can only imagine the amount of patience and diplomacy and patience, <laughs> patience again, in in achieving that, um, especially well, at that, that level. That, I think, is something that, um, you know, was uh, one of the the things that you had to learn to do in this field. Um because most of the staff that I hired are people who come out of the idealism spectrum, young people with an activist bent who are keen on the issues that we are working on, and they're always in a hurry. Um, Whereas the work itself takes years and decades uh, to get through. And just to give you a small example, I am now working at this point um, on the Sustainable Development Goals post-2015, which is, for those of your viewers or listeners, um, the Millennium Development Goals will end December 2015, um, and the international community for the last two years has been negotiating replacement goals, which are going to be more ambitious, which are going to bring in environment, which are going to bring in rule of law, which are going to bring in um, various other issues. And there I'm working on one small aspect, which is the entire um, set of draft goals, which are 17 at this point, and sub-targets, which are 169, did not till July of last year include anything on clean air or air quality. And I spent from July till December just trying to get these two words, air quality, into the text. Wow. We we finally succeeded, but unfortunately not in the right spot. It's not as a first order norm in the first 17 rules that are drafted. It's in 11.6, so it's in a sub-category. And now I'm working to try and get it out of the sub-category into a first order norm because it is the, really it is, Key measure of sustainability, and well, one that is very is, easy to measure, very easy to measure, and very easy to measure improvements over the next 15 years to 2030. Well, I'm curious about that omission until you stepped up and took this on. But um, like, I'm wondering, um, in the other environmental initiatives, did they have other ones like clean water and why was yes, air there's, sort of... there's a lot of activism on water issues, on biodiversity, on a range of other things. And part of it is that the NGO community, the nonprofit community, is very well organized on those issues. On the air quality area, what is interesting and frustrating to me was I approached all the big names you know, Earth Justice, World Lung Foundation, NRDC, you name it. I approached all of them and said, this is a gap. Can we work together on this? 
I got either silence or replies that were like, well, you know, we're focusing on non-smoking or we're focusing on indoor air, not ambient air quality. Um, and the one I'm working on is ambient air quality because the outside air is the one that gov only governments can do something about by changing well, the mean, law and by enforcing. Yeah, I'm assuming that the that the the issue is uh, corporate interests. Um, the issue is actually not necessarily because, you know, corporations have a way of looking down the pike and when they see an, in, an issue changing, they are pretty nimble at changing the products that they are bringing in. So you see actually that the corporations have begun to invest in green growth. They've begun to invest in solar, wind, this, that, various ways of, you know, cleaning the air if cities and countries decide they want to go down that road. The U.S. has pretty good domestic air quality uh, standards since the Clean Air Act, um, and it also has actually reports to prove the effect over 30 years. The EU also has very good regional standards. The problem lies more in the emerging economies of Asia and other places, that as they're industrializing rapidly, it's there where the air quality has gone beyond dangerous levels. You know, in certain parts of South Asia, children are being born with emphysema <laughs> at birth, which means yeah. that they have smokers' lungs before they even start their life. The, um, some of the pictures of China and the stories of China about the air quality problems there have, have been um, shocking, I guess. So, well, the interesting but, thing is that, you know, until this year, China was one of the countries resisting um, sort of this issue being front and center number one. Mm -hmm. They, however, seem to have started to do a reverse. Um, and, you know, it's kind of counter to what one normally thinks, which is that it's not, a, you know, an elected democratic system, but the cities have fairly powerful mayors who have begun to push internally. And China's government has now this year declared a war against pollution. And if you notice the latest New York Times piece, it talks about how it is now the WHO report shows that it is Delhi now, which is the most polluted city from an air quality point of view, and South Asia and Southeast Asia, where we really need more action. Oh, that's because, interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Because when realize. you actually, yeah, because I think the Chinese system is that while they were not paying any attention to it, they were industrializing and polluting rapidly. Once they started to pay attention, they have, because they're, I guess, not, you know, because it's a pretty monolithic government structure, they're capable of enforcing change. And they will, because they also realize that there's an economic cost to bad air quality. Now, that's interesting. It's interesting. And, I, and again, I think it's interesting that, that, to me, that water and air were receiving such very different treatment politically. Um, yes. I think it's also because um, air is one where it requires multiple responses at the national and regional levels. You know, coal plants in China can affect the air quality in California, so you actually need everyone in the same harness. Yes. Um, so it makes it much harder to get agreement and implementation and action. Mm-hmm. Well, if but I, if I'm you, plugging away. I'm plugging away, and we've got <laughs> only a few that. months. We've got just a few months because by July, these goals will be set in stone. They are going to go from the 17 to bring them down to 12, and I'm pushing that air quality is one of the 12. It just—it's remarkable to me that that's something that you have to make this hard case for. It's such an obvious. Um, it's such an obvious environmental sustainability issue. It, it, it seems almost crazy that it was – that. You it is, but you hard. know what's interesting is, I mean, for example, the United States is what in the UN parlance is called P1, which is, you know, out of the 
is the top power in the UN system. Um, you know, there's permanent five, P5, and of the P5, P1 is the U.S. The mm -hmm. U.S. delegation has not been pushing for this. And part of it is that no one's pushing them to push for it. Aha. Uh -huh. So the whole key is getting, in this country, your own domestic, environmental, and citizen groups to politically push your government to take this issue up. Why is it that the um, the environmental organizations in this country are not being more proactive on the clean on air? They, I think part of it is funding. What happens is that a lot of grant making happens on issues. Well, first of all, domestically, they don't have so much pressure on the air quality here. So they see that as a been there, done that battle for the domestic front. Mm -hmm. um, so there isn't grant making money going to them to fight for clean air in the U.S. When it comes to international, much of the grant making money from people like Bloomberg and others is going to items that I would call under individual action working on indoor air. So things like stopping people from smoking, the banned smoking campaign is getting a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, some aspects of indoor air pollution is getting it too because those again are they're in your control as an individual. You can go buy an air purifier. You can do this. You can do that. Yeah, yeah. And this is a very individual-based country in terms of our philosophy. Oh yes. You know? Oh yes. 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 So yeah. the notion of taking up a public good like air quality on a global level is is not something that's front and center. I think the other aspect mm -hmm. is that there's a lot of confusion among the, even these very large groups, and I've approached them through emails, through I've made a test of myself several times. They are very focused in their international work on the climate change negotiations at COP21 for Paris later this year. And this is something that's detracting from that in their view. Even though it's something that actually on a daily level would be affecting more. Yes, in fact, I think they're directly connected. That seems, um, yeah. it seems like the way the political process is structured. Well, um, put the word that... out there to your viewers that <laughs> yes. they should start writing to the to the State Department and the EPA um, as to work, for them to work together to bring the same standard to the international setting on clean air. All right. That's, a, that's something we can do. Um, and the, I, I, if you don't mind my shifting focus, um, sure. we had spoken really briefly um, about some of your work um, in the area of women's reproductive rights. And, uh, right. And I uh, just very interested in um, in the work that you did. Um, you made reference to, I think, the Cairo Program of Action, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which, for people that might not know, that was um, it came out of a conference in 1994, and it was um, a program of action around women's rights, reproductive, and I think sexuality and just all kinds of uh, women's body rights. And then um, that Cairo program was, again, a year later at the Fourth World Conference um, for Women in Beijing. It was either incorporated or sort of uh, reinforced in their platform for action. It was and, reinforced. It was not incorporated. The two were separate. Okay. It was reinforced. Um, and... Uh, so could you speak a little bit about that? And um, I guess for me, one of the areas that I see is so large is that when women's rights, um, reproductive rights, rights to our sexuality and so on, are um, up against cultural mores or religious edicts or anything like that, it, it just becomes very difficult to get movement because one is accused of 
you know, cultural imperialism or just outright racism. And, uh, you know, there's, there's just, it's, it's difficult how to frame it as human rights or are we now infringing on, you know, ethnic, um, rights to self-determination and so on. I'm not expressing myself very clearly, but I'm just no. very curious <laughs> about how you were able to move forward how, with that. Well, first I think, you know, um, there's a couple of things here. I have always done my work within the framework of the United Nations. So, because I believe that that framework gives this issue, it gets rid of this issue of whether it's imperialist or whether it's coming from somewhere else, because the UN system requires all all items to be done by consensus. It's very few items that get sent to the General Assembly for a two-thirds majority vote. And even that gives enough of a majority vote from the assembly that it doesn't mean that you are then accused of it coming from one region. Uh -huh. So that's on a structural basis. That's how I feel that any issue, um, you can get movement without having to get caught in that debate. The second is that when it comes to a lot of issues that are both societal and individual within a family, um, definitely culture and religion will become part of it. Uh, I mean, you know, here are the politics. On, I worked on the issue of abortion, which across the world is one of those issues. Um, in this country, you know, politicians stand and fall on that issue, mm -hmm. so as they do elsewhere. Um, and what I did when it came to my task, which was to get a consensus among parliamentarians and legislators from around the world on the language of what that final paragraph would look like for, for Cairo um, on the issue of abortion, I decided not to get into this debate of when does life start. Because mm -hmm. that would just end up getting the same politicians arguing with each other. Mm -hmm. And I put into the pool of people that I worked with for, I started this work in 93 when I joined the organization as Director for Democracy and Development, and then we, you know, it was a year-long series, a year and a half, that led to finally the dispute agreement in Cairo. Um, and it had people who were sort of Christian Democrats from Chile to Catholics from the Philippines to whatever, Muslims, Hindus, all religions politically right to left, men and women represented. As we got closer to the Cairo conference itself, the conference organizers had given in terms of, because governments were in charge of chairing different working groups, and the working group on abortion was led by Pakistan, uh, which made things a little easier for me. Mm -hmm. At the same time, this was under the government of Benazir Bhutto, who was the first woman to be Prime Minister of an Islamic country, um, and she was a progressive. She had appointed as Minister for Health and Family Planning a Catholic man, um, which was a very interesting thing because part of the battles that we had with the Catholic Church were, were dealt with by him. Um, now, when it came to actually dealing with the issue, we dealt with it by not focusing on a rights-based approach, but by focusing on a responsibility-based approach. That the state had a responsibility to saving lives and to ensuring that the health of its citizens was not damaged. And I focused with these legislators in a core group, those who were medically trained in some fashion, that they'd been the nurses before, they'd been doctors before they'd entered the legislature, so that they had some physical understanding of what an abortion is and the circumstances in which it is performed. And what happens when they, the medical system also has to deal with repairing damage is done by badly done abortions. Yes. That so that was, we were that was already... That was incredibly wonderful. So that, we, that was 
brilliant strategy. That was just wonderful. Right. So it took it out of the kind of theoretical um, religious realm, and it brought the discussion into where it's actually happening. What that meant was that the the paragraphs that we came up with for the language were focused entirely on, you know, where necess- where it's necessary for health reasons, under the advice of medical practitioners, abortion would be safe. Yes. And then we dealt with the issue of country by country, where was it legal, under what conditions was it legal, etc., um, and what helped me was that in Pakistan, it was legal in the first 40 days under any circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, you know, it was one where um, various elements came together to come up with a health and responsibilities based approach for the state. That um, was that your idea to approach it that way? Were you the one that? Yes. Um, yes. I, I, yes, I just have to idea. tell you that was um, that was just to me really strategically brilliant. Um, yes, that was my idea, um, and also picking the legislators um, was my idea. What was, of course, some of them were brilliant. I mean, the woman who helped me the most was the former health minister of Pakistan. She was a gynecologist herself. She passed away, unfortunately, um, last year, and she came from a very conservative tribal background, but she, you know, knew the whole system. And this Catholic minister, Julius Salik, was also very, very helpful because he dealt with the issue with the church in a way that prevented it from turning into a drama. Wonderful. Yeah, that's that, that could not have been easy. But I think it was especially important that you got away from like the when is life begin argument. When is it beginning and also this whole notion of, because you see the state machinery and the state apparatus and the state legal system in any country is focused more on group rights than it is on individual rights. And so you have to get away from this notion of this is my right as an individual, You get otherwise you end up arguing with them, you talk to them more in terms of this is your duty as a state. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's um, that's heartening. It's heartening to hear, and I'm so grateful that a woman with your experience strategically was in the position at the right time, at the right place to um, to affect that change. So... Um, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's heartening. I, I, you know, I do um, cultural work around um, lesbian rights a lot, and just listening to you talk about that and the moving of it away from the rights to the responsibility of the state, uh, that's just a helpful shift for me. Um, yes, I know. I know on any we- rights issue, on any rights issue, there are two ways to approach it, and you have to see which one will work. Yeah, and I felt like um, the biggest traction we ever got was when we just began to talk about the harm to the children. You know, while everybody's arguing whether it's a choice or not or you're born with it, meanwhile, young people were killing themselves and harming themselves in whatever very is high going numbers. To, yeah, whatever is going to do, you know, the harm reduction approach is, uh, the, is better from a state point of view. Yeah. And also the notion that you have to get it into a consensus system across countries, that tends to bring a different approach as well. Yes, yeah. That's, uh, well, that's the beauty of the UN. So um, uh, w- this, um, you're one of our few international speakers, and we'd be very interested if you could would share with us what you'd like about women in Africa, Asia, Pakistan, or Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Uh, repeat that question. What would you like me to share about that? Um, just anything that that you know you feel would be important for um, listeners to know. 
Well, I think the most important international question this uh, at this moment is going to be looking forward to 2016. I know that in this country there's going to be a national election at which we hope that there will be a woman running. Um, but on an international level, that's also the year that the Secretary General of the UN will be replaced. And there has never been a woman. There has never even been a woman nominated. So this is a moment when, um, you know, on this coming weekend, women are going to be gathering for the Commission on Status of Women. And one of the things that I am going to be talking about uh, at various um, panels that I'm on is that this is a year where we want governments to nominate women. That's wonderful. That's great. Um, Doesn't mean yeah. we're going to get it. Well, <laughs> well, my first thought, given how things change, is you should, at the very minimum, at least there, a woman should be nominated for the position. Um, that that seems. Well, like the, the United very, States has a very important role here. As I said, it is P1, and the Secretary General is chosen by P5, by the five major powers, right. which yes. is the U.S., Russia, China, who are the P3, and U.K. and France. So it is going to be extremely important if your listeners push Washington and particularly President Obama that he will not allow his representative at the UN to put forward, to allow any nomination to go forward if there aren't women on that ballot. Oh, that's a, well, that's another thing, the very concrete thing that people can do to write or call the White House. And Absolutely. let them know, let let Obama know that the that the nominations must include um, the, the they nominations must include at least fifty percent women. Fifty percent women, at least. I yeah. would say more because you know we're making up for seventy years of only men. I but yeah, <laughs> yeah. At least. Yes. Yeah. That's true. Well. Um, yes. That's important. And, you're, and you said that you're putting that forward this weekend? Is that? Yes, on March 8th. Yeah. Um, how, in terms of um, international goals for women's rights, what have you seen um, that gives you hope and also that raises concerns since Cairo? Obviously but let's look at what today. raises concerns, because I think it's more important to look at what's not done yet. Um, I think the economic rights area is the one that gives me the most concern. We are nowhere near equality on um, income, wealth, and our ability to, you know, make ourselves financially secure in any country. Um, and this is one where I think we have, as movements also, as feminism also, sort of somehow still remained in that trap that it's not, it's not feminine to talk about money. I think it's extremely important for young girls to be taught how to deal with money, how to manage it, how to negotiate for it, how to invest it. Um, and for governments to mandate that because, and to mandate that in the education system, to mandate equal pay um, federally by law and to have ways of actually monitoring it and actually doing, you know, audits of companies to see what they actually are doing. You're talking about this in, in just basic educational systems and where I'm else? talking about it in educational systems. I'm talking about it in the employment market. I'm talking about it in every every aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and do you think and that this that is that the is area which This is the area which the feminist movement has not been good about taking on and dealing with. Well, I remember, I remember in the 70s, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on that and to teach your daughter about money, and, and there were a few women's banks that were opened, and, um, yeah, there was a real attempt to kind of make up for that gap in women's education around money. I'm sad to hear that that doesn't seem like it had carried a lot of momentum and, and that we're falling behind in that area. 
But I'm wondering if just education about it is enough. Um, no, if the, no, education about it is not the only thing. As I said, there has to be federally mandated laws. I think we now have a law signed in by Obama on equal pay. It's taken that long. Um, for U.S. listeners, it's important that the Equal Rights Amendment be passed. We have to yes. make that our priority. We have to put aside. I mean, one of the things that I'm very disappointed about in the women's movement internationally is that we tend to argue for ourselves as if we are a minority. We're not a minority. If you leave it to the natural system of birth, women are more than 50%. Right. There isn't sort of, you know, feet aside. And you account for the missing girls in certain countries, it's more than 50%. And we seem to argue for ourselves as if we're apologizing and we're a minority. Yeah. Uh, do you think that's just a cultural thing, or no? Um, I think it's across. It's across the globe. Mhm. Mm yeah. Yeah. I just thinking in in terms of my own career, the discrimination against women in theater is is staggering. Women playwrights um, representation. It's in of women. every field. It's yeah. in every field, and it's because we are not, you know, pushing for the things. I mean, we have done a good job in pushing for education, in pushing for equal access to education. You will find now in universities, you know, they're having to do affirmative action for the guys. Um, but we haven't done enough on the economic front when you come out of the education system. And that's where this equalizing needs to take place and not as if we are a, a special, you know, as if we are a special interest group of a minority. No, we are the majority. And we well, that, that's have kind that. of, yeah, I felt that a lot in my field and that, Rather than organize ourselves and organize our own theaters um, and take that power, what I see women doing is being much more comfortable constantly trying to get the attention of the powerful men in the industry about how unfair it is and to, to trying to get a seat at the, the men's table. And in 30 years of watching that, I feel like we would have gotten much more traction if we had organized among ourselves and raise money for our own theaters and for our own campaigns um, to... Possibly. I mean, I think you have to do both. You have to do both because, you know, I mean, initially they set up the women's colleges. I went to Bryn Mawr College, which is one of those. But eventually in the education system, women got access to the other universities, and now it is totally equalized. So I think you have to be able to do both because eventually it is the table on which both sit that is the real table of power. Mm-hmm. Mhm. Mm yeah. Well, lots to be said about that, about the economic empowerment of women. Um, I just, yeah, it's it's a difficult thing. I just thinking personally of a conversation I was in on this week where a woman, you know, she she had um, negotiated for a salary raise and she had you know done it very assertively and was kind of being punished for it. And most of us felt that had she been male and used the same approach, she would have gotten the raise. Um, and so you know, it's sort of like, what do you do? You know. Uh, well, I think it can't be done at the level of the individual. It has to be mandated, and the mandate then has to actually have oversight, and there has to be audits of companies. Yeah. Yeah. There's no other way. That's true. That's true. Um, yeah, I don't see in this country a lot of momentum for passing the Equal Rights Amendment. It's almost like that was a thing that came out of the first wave, and then in the 70s there was momentum, and, you know, it just feels like I guess I'm not terribly optimistic that that's going to get a lot of traction. Um, well, but, I guess then that's your next challenge of reform. Yes, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, um, I'm sitting here looking at my notes. Um, so you feel like in terms of the women's, um, the kind of women's empowerment agenda, that the economic situation is the, is the one of the most concern? It's the one of most concern because I think if you look at the actual statistics, this is where um, there are real dangers. Um, 
women as they age, women as they're taking care of both children and the elderly, women as they are sort of, you know, not um, coming out of the job market with the same packages um, and with the same level of security. Um, all of this is, is extremely important, and that is where the attention is needed. Mhm. Yeah. Well, um I just we're getting close to wrapping up here. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the listeners of the podcast um about what we can do to um I love I'm the presuming idea. that most of your listeners are um in the United States. Yes. Okay. Well, I think this year most urgent is this issue on the sustainable development goals in ensuring that clean air is taken up by the U.S. delegation uh, very forcefully between March and July. Um, so they should write to um, both the State Department, uh, to Secretary Kerry, as well as to the head of the EPA that they need to work together to get the U.S. good track record um, pushed as an international record. Um, and the second thing is that um, from the point of view of the women's movement, there needs to be a real revival around the economic rights issue. All right. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Well, I want to thank you for sharing um, such a global perspective. Um, and I'm overwhelmed by your activism and also how strategically savvy um, your actions have been, especially the um, the women's the, the abortion thing. That was just I, I wish you were leading campaigns in the United States. I think they wouldn't have derailed in down these pointless. Conversations well, about Well, I'm I'm together. a consultant now. I'm available, so if anybody All right. wants to tell them to call me, <laughs> you, should. you should just tell them these won't work. Don't let the conversation go in this direction. This will not work, I and mean, it would save so many activists. I think in that field, um, a great deal of um, non-productive expenditure of energy. Right. Well, thank you again so much, You're and welcome. I think I'm going to turn this over to Jenny again. It was an incredible privilege to hear you speak, and thank you yes. so much for your activism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafi, and thank you to Carolyn Gage. Thank you very much, both of you. You can find out more about Shazia's work at her website, shaziarafi.com. That's S H A Z I A. R-A-F-I dot com, and you'll find more interviews and articles in a very impressive photo gallery of world dignitaries, forums, and assemblies. Um, and for world news campaigns and programs that you do not hear about, check out Parliamentarians for Global Action at pgaction.org. And you can learn more about the Beijing Platform for Women's 20th Anniversary at Beijing 20. .unwomen.org. And you can sign up for Carolyn's newsletter at carolyngage.com. Carolyn tours in her own shows and is available for lectures and workshops on lesbian culture and history. Thank you again, Shazia Rafi and Carolyn Gage. And thank you for listening in. We hope we have informed and inspired you in many ways. And we hope you will try to catch more of the interviews in this series on feminism and sustainability, as well as our other podcast series on issues important to us as women. And please share these issues with your these interviews with your family and friends. You never know who you may be inspiring. No matter what your description or experience of feminism is, we hope to have heightened your understanding of feminism's important role in all aspects of sustainability and restored and strengthened your resolve to build alliances for the future. For it is clear that none of us are really alone. Keep listening. Bye for now.